Schwab Asset Management is proud to support the Inside ETFs podcast. As one of the nation's largest ETF providers, Schwab Asset Management offers insights and perspectives that can help advisors build on their ETF expertise. Did you know that more millennials are choosing ETFs as their investment vehicle of choice? Or that many investors plan to increase their allocation to fixed income, smart beta, and actively managed ETFs? Find out how ETFs can support your clients' goals with Schwab Asset Management's educational resources. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash ETF know-how. Hello and welcome to Inside ETFs, the podcast where we bring the latest and greatest ETF industry perspectives directly to you through in-depth conversations with key thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm your host, Douglas Jonas, the head of exchange traded products at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Now, today I'm joined by my friend Christian Magoon. Christian is the founder and CEO of Amplify ETFs. He's an ETF pioneer. Christian has launched over 70 ETFs in the United States, and he continues to help drive the adoption of ETFs through his educational efforts. The Amplify lineup of ETFs is broad and successful, and I'm excited to have him here with us to discuss the markets. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Doug, it's great to be with you, and uh, thanks for having me. So I'm hoping we can kind of start at the beginning, if you don't mind, you know, a little little career journey into Christian Magoon. But, <laughs> you know, how, how did you get into the ETF business? And was there a spot when you look back and say, hey, these are sort of pivotal moments that led me to where I am today? Looking back on it, you know, this is my 25th year in the business uh, in, I guess, what I call the package product business. And you know, I began my career in kind of the late 90s at a company called First Trust Portfolios, which today we know is a top 10 ETF sponsor. Uh, when I worked there, they actually didn't uh, have any ETFs um, in the late 90s. And then from there, I moved to a company called Claymore Securities, who um, decided to launch ETFs. Claymore, as well as First Trust, really began their businesses focusing on something that's a little bit similar to an ETF, which is a unit investment trust. And, you know, these are, you know, transparent portfolios that are usually based off an index or a list of stocks. So I knew a lot of the kind of the features, if you will, of some of the transparency and known portfolio that, that ETFs provide via the UIT business. You know, in addition, uh, Claymore had uh, launched a series of closed-end funds, um, most of them all listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So I knew some of the benefits of being exchange traded as well. And then uh, about 2005 at Claymore, uh, we decided to um, file for exemptive relief. Back then, it was a sometimes a, a year or so process to get that exemptive relief to launch ETFs, and launched our first products. You know, kind of at uh, year end uh, of 2006, and um, off we went uh, with the ETF business at Claymore that became one of the faster growing you know ETF businesses of the time. I remember um, talking to a reporter at the Wall Street Journal when we launched our business and they said, hey, Christian, you know, here's a, a question that I just want to ask you, you know, you're now going to be the 15th ETF sponsor in the United States to enter the market. Don't you think that it might be oversaturated? And, you know, at the time, we really looked at the mutual fund market as what the ETF market could be in terms of the amount of, amount of offerings, the amount of sponsors there. So we thought, boy, we are still in the early days. And, you know, lo and behold, we've had hundreds of ETF issuers today and thousands of ETF products. So um, it's been great to see kind of the adoption of ETFs and what that's done in, in a good way for investors in terms of more efficient access to areas they didn't have uh, exposure to before or were very costly to get you know, the tax efficiency that comes from ETFs relative to many other vehicles has been a, a benefit. So it's been a growing industry, but uh, along the way, it's taken, I think, uh, investors with it and provided them a lot of uh, benefits. You know, for me, I, I would say when you ask about like pivotal moments, probably my biggest pivotal moment was, you know, in 2010, uh, our company Claymore Securities was sold to, uh, I guess, late 2009, was sold to a company called Guggenheim Investments. So the, all the work we had done in this product line, you know, went to another company. And, you know, I was president of Claymore Securities when that occurred and decided to leave. And um, 
the pivot for me around in 2010 was I started my own firm and that really was focused on helping others launch ETFs and ultimately became me launching Amplify ETFs, my own sponsor. And, and, you know, there I had some, you know, colleagues from previous jobs that really encouraged me to step out and not necessarily be a part of a big company that I did have some of the experience and the instincts and the connections to be able to be an entrepreneurial person in that space and to be able to create product. And that's led to, you know, a lot of great opportunities um, through the years, including Amplify now here, which, uh, you know, has been out in the market with with product for uh, just over six years. So it's been a fun journey and uh, look forward to the next, you know, 10, 15 years and pretty excited uh, because, you know, we have some great momentum here, even in a tough market in 2022. Yeah, and I love, Christian, that you're willing to share that journey. You know, over the course of the year that we've launched this podcast, we get a lot of feedback from younger listeners talking about, hey, people who are at, at you know, the top, the CEOs, how they got there was shocking to them. They think, you know, there's this sort of direct route and direct plan, and you're a perfect example of taking the best of everything you're doing and taking it on to the next thing and doing it again and doing it different and looking for opportunities and taking those when they come up and and frankly just being a great person along the way i remember the first time we met i guess probably seven years ago and it was just you were out there building this great new business and doing it the right way with great people and that that's never changed regardless of of size of success and so so exciting to be a part of that journey for advisors that may not be familiar with your firm, right? They might not know Amplify. They might know some of your ETFs and not realize. Could you share a bit about who you are, who your team is, your ethos? Yeah. So, you know, Amplify ETFs, um, and we came into the marketplace in 2016 as a new ETF sponsor. And, you know, just like I shared before, we were you know, like the 15th ETF sponsor back in the days of launching our Claymore ETF business. Now, fast forward, you know, to 2016, and I think we launched, we, I think at the time, we're like the 120th new ETF sponsor. <laughs> and people, you know, again said, boy, you know, 120 sponsors, do you really think you guys can, you know, create momentum? We're obviously a, a small kind of startup ETF provider that, although we were young, had some fairly experienced people. So, you know, we've got a great team at Amplify. We've got, you know, a lot of our, our, our people have been in the business, you know, close to 25 years. And by that business, I mean, whether it's the mutual fund business or package product business, you know, when you look at the ETF experience level, though, most people have been in, you know, 15 plus years. So uh, we've got kind of a, 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 a outsized experience level based off our company profile, and that really helped us grow. So we started, you know, around a, you know, that 120, 25 mark. And, you know, today we're, I guess, the 38th largest ETF provider in the U.S. out of 210 sponsors. So many more uh, sponsors have entered the fray, and we've been able to surpass uh, many of the sponsors that were there originally. We have 15 products uh, listed here in the U.S., and our product line is really divided into three categories. We have core offerings, we have income offerings, and then we have these thematic offerings. Um, you know, initially, many people knew us from our innovative thematic offerings, so we launched the first online retail ETF, iBuy. You know, we launched the the first you know actively managed uh, solution in 2018. Uh, you know, covering blockchain uh, with our block ETF. Many people kind of encountered us through those products, uh, and today, you know, um, our largest you know products really reside in the income space. Uh, you know, some of that's due to market direction. So, um, you know, our flagship product is our uh, Amplify CWP Enhanced Dividend Income ETF, DIVO, DIVO, uh, which is five-star rated and I'm sure we'll talk about uh, at some point today. Uh, so, uh, and then we have our core offerings. And, you know, what we're trying to do here is not create different versions of what's already in the toolbox for investors and advisors. We're trying to do um, do product development in a way that's additive to investors' uh, toolboxes. So we didn't do just another retail ETF because those existed. Uh, instead, we did the first online retail ETF. Um, you know, we didn't do um, another dividend ETF. Instead, we did 
an enhanced dividend ETF that not only owns dividend yielding stocks, but also has an active covered call overlay to essentially double the income potential for investors. So we're trying to be innovative in what we bring to market and additive. And I think that's been you know, part of our success. We don't always get it right for sure uh, because it's hard to time markets as we've seen, especially over the last uh, year or so. Uh, but you know, we think if we can be additive um, to investors' portfolios and maybe even uncover some new opportunities that don't exist in the ETF space or even strategies that don't exist in the ETF space, that we're going to be able to get a seat uh, at the table. And, uh, you know, I mentioned we're 38th largest in assets under management out of 210 firms here today in 2022, year to date. Um, but, you know, we're 29th in terms of inflows as a sponsor. So even in kind of a tough time uh, with, uh, with at a company that uh, in the markets and then at, with a company that does have a fair amount of growth and thematics, we're still kind of being able to outpace and gain market share in a, in a market that is challenging for most sponsors. As a matter of fact, you know, the other little tidbit I'd share with you is we have more shares outstanding in our ETFs than ever before. We're at record shares outstanding. Our shares have increased by 15% this year across our Amplify ETF product line. So we continue to grow even in tough times. Uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, that's not boastful. Um, it's a challenge for us. How do we continue to do that? And that's really utilizing kind of our team that we have a lot of experience, um, you know, riding these types of markets and trying to, you know, create products that are meaningful um, and then having a diversified product line. So um, it's, you know, continues to be a fun journey. And we'd love for, you know, investors, advisors to check out Amplify ETFs because we think between our income, our core and thematic products, there'll be several new ideas that investors will be able to encounter that are quite additive to what they may already have in their portfolio. Yeah, let's let's stay on that theme, right? Because I think you you know as you, as you look backwards, you're able to to talk about how your teams capitalized on unique products and product developments uh, over the years. Are there specific trends that you and the team are, are looking at and sort of focusing on right now? Yeah, so alternative income, I think, um, is a big focus for us. And that's, you know, still, I think, relevant here, even though rates have, you know, gone upward this year and may continue in 2023, there's still a huge demographic demand for income. And there's a demand for income that doesn't just come from, let's say, bonds, or doesn't just come from dividend stocks. So finding you know, new strategies to harvest um, either alternative sources of income or additional sources of income. So again, you know, like speaking about one of our you know, most successful products has been Devo. And you know, we're seeing a lot of dividend ETF investors say, you know, this is great to own a dividend ETF, but you know, in tough market conditions, I may have some, you know challenges from a capital appreciation standpoint. And, you know, I have a cushion, uh, which is that dividend income that may be two and a half or 3%, but it's not much of a cushion. Um, and, you know, our approach to that space is to, you know, own those, you know, same dividend yielding stocks, maybe own a little bit higher quality mix, still, you know, participate in those dividends, but then have a manager be able to tactically write covered calls on that exact portfolio so that the income potential, instead of maybe being two and a half, is you know five, maybe even six. So it kind of doubles your income stream. At the same time, it acts as a more effective cushion. So we're looking at other strategies related to that alternative income that I think um, could be additive to investors' portfolios. The other you know, area that we're not going to abandon is finding these long-term themes that are playing out in the marketplace over time. And these are industries or market segments that maybe don't fit in the classic S&P uh, sector or GICs categorization. So you think of areas that we've looked at before and brought to market that have been successful, like online retail, uh, blockchain, um, those are examples of areas that really aren't traditional industries, uh, but we were able to use revenue tests to really focus in on those trends um, that we think are you know, going to play out over the next 10 years. You know, we're looking for trends that have 
three supporters, if you will, from a spending and a kind of an action standpoint. And by that, I mean, when you see governments, corporations, and consumers spend money and um, take action steps that relate to a theme, you know that that theme is going to have legs. And, you know, we see that, you know, in blockchain, we see it in online retail, you know, even our our bat, our battery ETF, um, the, kind of the electrification of fossil fuels, we see that happening in a big way there. Those are really good, um, we think, uh, indications of being able to invest in a theme that's unique, that has, you know, a long runway and is going to present opportunities for capital appreciation for investors over time. You know, the caveat there is in markets like 2022, where many of these themes fit in this growth category, um, they're going to be sold off. There's going to be downward volatility. So, you know, as a, an investor, you have to keep that discipline to still look at those areas and still have some type of allocation if you are a long-term growth investor and not abandon it when they're quote unquote on sale. And the same happens, you know, from an ETF product perspective. You know, we want to continue to develop those and search for those themes, even in tough markets, because in, in fact, that may be one of the best times to, you know, bring products like that to market. So although we know we can sell alternative income and we see a lot of demand for it, we want to continue to, you know, force ourselves to uncover these themes that are going to be what we believe long-term winners from a capital appreciation standpoint, despite maybe being on sale or out of favor right now due, due to a risk-off environment. So those are, I think, the two kind of trends we're focusing on, uh, building on our income product and then continuing to keep our eye on uh, the ball for new themes to emerge. Because as you know, this world continues to evolve and new segments that are not traditional are going to create value and, and disrupt traditional industries. And we want to be there to provide convenient access via an ETF vehicle for investors. Yeah. And as a reminder, you can learn about all the ETFs we're discussing at the website, etfcentral.com. It's a free website. Go right into the search screener. Uh, you can type in Amplify. You'll see all the Amplify ETFs. Christian mentioned his battery ETF. You can just type in battery. It'll bring up BATT, the Amplify Lithium and Battery Technology ETF. So that's etfcentral.com. Uh, Christian, I want to talk a little bit about the close of 2022, right? We're, we're kind of he heading into the year end here. We're only a few weeks away. There's two things I, I was hoping we could bring up. One is, are there challenges out there that, that you're seeing and you think, hey, here are some, some sort of best practices for investors to manage their risk. And at the same time, there's discussion around tax planning and year end and, and utilizing ETFs. What, what are you seeing out there? Yes, yeah, so let me give you two. Um, one in terms of like investor, you know, challenges uh, and risks. You know, I think the risk of a recession next year is definitely growing. And, you know, if you have a recession, you know, you want to, I think, focus even more so on high quality companies from a, you know, stock perspective. And um, so looking at, you know, um, troubled economic times, and it may be a light recession. It seems like it's more likely it would be a light recession that is really, you know, artificially induced here by the Fed trying to cool off the economy. That's the good news. But still, if we are in a recession, that's going to impact, you know, the consumer, consumer spending, as well as kind of earnings outlook for, for firms. So owning higher quality companies um, that have, you know, strong balance sheets, we think is going to be important. Um, so I think investors need to kind of look forward a little bit and try to anticipate that in their allocations. Um, and, you know, obviously many investors towards year end or right at the beginning of the year are reviewing their portfolio allocations. And that, this could be a great, you know, potential risk to keep in mind. You know, last year around the same time we were talking about inflation risk, you know, inflation risk has moderated, um, you know, it still could be there, um, probably the biggest risk risk, you know, in our, our view is is still energy, energy prices. Uh, we saw kind of what happened um, last year and how it kind of became an elevated risk environment when it came to energy uh, with the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. So that's another area to be, I think, mindful of. You, you know, there's certain sectors that, you know, actually benefit from, you know, rising inflation. These are generally, you know, stocks, sectors that are producing kind of hard goods and services. Um, versus, 
you know, technology, for example, or communications uh, as two sectors that don't tend to fare as well. So those are two kind of risks that I think are should be on investors' minds uh, going into 2023. But yeah, in terms of, you know, you know, tax planning and year end, this is going to be a, a interesting year. You know, let's face it, the ETF business is growing. And at some point, it'll be the largest kind of fun business in the United States. But today it's not. Today it takes a backseat to mutual funds. And we know that the reason ETFs are gaining market share and becoming more and more popular is uh, partly because of their you know, lower cost than the average mutual fund, but it's also due to their tax efficiency relative to mutual funds. You know, in mutual funds, um, you know, if you have a down year in a mutual fund, you could potentially get uh, a tax bill even in a down year. Um, and, you know, that's not a good outcome if you have a mutual fund and a taxable account. ETFs are much less likely. In, in fact, it's very unusual to see um, ETFs, you know, have a tax distribution uh, in a, a year where they make money, let alone when they lose money. So, you know, this year where many funds, many mutual funds are going to be down for the year, they will have, they will have still done some selling that have created you know, tax distributions. So many mutual fund owners who are down on the year in their mutual fund are going to get, um, you know, unrealized capital gains distributions and have to pay taxes. And, you know, Doug, that's like being invited to, um, you know, to, to clean up a party that you didn't even attend. I mean, what, there's no, no good uh, outcome on that. So, um, you know, I think investors really need to take a look at their mutual fund positions, look at what kind of capital gains distributions may be coming out, and one way to sidestep that potentially is to sell that fund and then look at an ETF that has a similar investment objective. Um, you know, the other, you know, I think consideration for investors is, you know, looking at certain, you know, stock positions they may have um, that may be down for the year where they may be able to harvest those tax losses and take that write off. So sell those. And then maybe look for an ETF that has, you know, a similar uh, focus or a, an objective. So, you know, we have an ETF that owns 45 discounted closed end funds and, you know, has a, has a yield north of 10%. Um, many of the closed end funds in the marketplace this year are down for the year. So we've run into advisors, for example, who own individual funds who are selling some of these individual closed end funds, but they still need the income. And then they're going out and buying uh, our ETF of closed end funds so that they have a similar asset allocation and exposure to the closed end fund space, but they're able to take the tax loss for their clients in the individual position and then further diversify in the ETF. So yeah, good time of year to be thinking through, you know, some asset allocation moves as well as looking at tax planning and, you know, the best, you know, financial advisors are bringing this to the attention of their clients and the most savvy individual investors are keeping an eye on their portfolio this time of year. So I want to kind of talk about the other side of the coin, right? And you've started to bring them up, but are there are there opportunities you see out in the marketplace and are there specific Amplify ETFs that you think could help seize those opportunities? Yeah, I, I think there really are, you know, opportunities that I would just say are they're on sale. So we talked a little bit about some of these themes that we've provided solutions for over the years at Amplify. And, you know, we know that there is more volatility in these themes because many of them are focused on growth stocks. Not all of them, but many of them are. And we really believe that this whole energy transition from fossil fuels to clean energy or green energy is still on track, despite many of the companies in these areas being uh, sold off in, in 2022. Uh, many of these companies, you know, tend to be, you know, higher PE growth companies, and that's not what the market favors uh, as rates rise here and, and recession risk grows. Um, you know, in addition, there's other companies in that space that maybe aren't the growth, the standard growth companies, but they're the traditional energy companies who understand that there's going to be an energy transition and they've changed how they're using or distributing their profits. Um, they're, you know, they're realizing that, you know, being an, uh, an oil and gas company, 
you know, may not be as sustainable 20 to 30 years from now as it was 20 or 30 years ago. And what many of these traditional energy companies are doing is not investing as much in the future with their profits. And instead, they're returning those profits back to shareholders in the form of increased dividends, special dividends, and buybacks. So, you know, two products that kind of cover what I just talked about that we think are, you know, kind of compelling solutions, but are two different approaches to this energy transition um, are our BAT ETF and our natural resources e, uh, dividend income ETF, NDIV. So let me just briefly mention BAT. BAT, uh, which you talked about uh, before, really is a group of three different types of companies. The battery um, materials and metals mining companies. So these are companies um, you know, mining lithium, manganese, um, copper, the, the, basically the underlying metals that go into batteries which you know, really is the bedrock of all clean energy, um, whether you're talking about electric vehicles or solar power or wind, you, know, you need batteries to store the energy and to you know, kind of disperse the energy. So BAT has about half of its portfolio in these battery metal and mining companies. And then the other half in battery technology companies and electric vehicle companies. So this is really the whole ecosystem that pertains to the, um, the electrification of fossil fuels. Now, this is more of a growth portfolio. Uh, and you know it's all contained in, in our ETF BAT, and it's on sale this year, despite you know, governments around the world offering incentives to buy EVs, um, outlawing the sale or manufacturer of internal combustion engine uh, 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 vehicles uh, in, in you know, many countries around the world. Um, you know, governments, corporations, you know, the amount of electric vehicles and batteries that, you know, are being um, uh, forecast in terms of um, demand are just through the charts. You know, you know, one electric vehicle has to use the equivalent of about 4,000 iPhone batteries. Well, that's problematic for um, the amount of kind of battery metals that we're able to produce. That's going to put these battery metal and mining companies in a really good spot in terms of, you know, what they're going to be able to receive for the product that they produce. Um, and then finally, consumers, you know, they get it. They don't want to pay high fuel costs for their vehicles, and they see kind of the fr fragility around fossil fuel pricing that we've, you know, even experienced in 2022. So we think BAT is a great kind of growth product that's on sale. It's a trend that's going to be happening across the world for over 10 years. On the flip side, uh, let's say you don't want to just look at capital appreciation. You want to actually have some income along the way. Our natural resources dividend income portfolio um, is a group of energy and materials companies. Um, and they're really split into kind of traditional um, um, companies, which are really these oil and gas companies. But because we have materials exposure, you also get these battery uh, metal and mining companies as well. So you get both types of companies in one ETF. And, you know, because we're focused on dividend income, the selection criteria foc uh, has a, a focus on companies that are paying 3% or more of their uh, of, of dividends in our high market capitalization, kind of more of the blue chip, if you will, 5 billion or more. And what that does is it creates a stream of income that right now is about nine and a half percent on our natural resources dividend income portfolio. So you get a nice income uh, uh, stream along the way, unlike BAT, which is really more of a growth portfolio, but you still get exposure to kind of old and new energy and kind of this whole electrification process. So uh, that's a theme that, you know, uh, I think you can play in different ways, depending on what you're looking for as an investor, either from an income standpoint and kind of a um, uh, or in income centric standpoint, or you can pay, play it more from a capital appreciation. Both of those products are, you know, generally on on sale this year. Um, NDIV has actually had better performance because energy stocks in general have 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 just had a great year, uh, partly due to kind of the price of energy earlier in the year rising so much. Uh, but that that is kind of a theme. If I could, you know, talk about one that I think makes a lot of sense, and that we have you know, kind of two ways for investors to access that.
Christian, is there an ETF in your lineup that just hasn't gotten the attention that you feel like it deserves? Yeah, so this is a little bit odd because I believe our largest ETF today, which is our Devo, D-I-V-O ETF, um, our enhanced dividend income ETF, really um, could be a lot larger and can see a lot more investor um, interest. You know, today it's around $2.4 billion. And in my opinion, rightfully so. It's a five-star rated fund by Morningstar uh, over the last five years, which is the highest rating um, Morningstar provides. Uh, in its category, Devo is in the top 1% of all derivative income ETFs uh, over the last five years. Um, this is an ETF that buys high quality blue chip companies, 20 to 25, collects the dividend income from these companies. And then also because it's actively managed, has the ability to write covered calls so uh, to de generate additional income. Uh, Devo over the last five years now has averaged over 10% a year in total return. So this is a product that gives you kind of an income stream around 5%, uh, uh, and that's paid on a monthly basis. Many people love to get a check on a monthly basis, retirees or people you know getting closer to retirement, but not but it's not just focused on giving that what we would say above average income. It also checks the box from a total return standpoint. And I know like maybe a year or two ago, 10% a year average annual returns over five years wouldn't be as attractive, but <laughs> my goodness, seems very attractive today. In fact, Devo even has a positive return year to date in 2022. So we think that this is a, a fund that you know, should be $5 billion versus 2.4. Um, you know, this is one of our kind of our original ETFs that we launched um, when we first, in our first year of Amplify. And we think it's uh, really adding a lot of value to investors. And, you know, we mentioned before that we may have some recession risk going into 2023. And Devo's portfolio of high quality companies, and by high quality, we mean companies that have a history of growing their earnings, as well as growing their dividends. We think that's just a, a great foundation to build your portfolio on, or, you know, complement your existing core allocation with, um, while getting paid kind of a nice income um, stream along the way. So we really believe that that uh, product is going to um, really blossom even further in 2023. And uh, we're excited to see it grow. And, you know, the team, uh, the Capital Wealth Planning Team, which is the group that manage, may actively manages this ETF, they're based in Naples, Florida, Kevin Simpson, who many people have seen on CNBC's halftime report, you know, is the active uh, portfolio manager there, heads up that portfolio management team. They've just been a great partner and they've been consistent along the way. You know, we launched an uh, international version of Devo, iDevo, uh, earlier this year, several months ago. So that's in the market too. So that same approach can be applied to the international space. And that has a yield a little, little, little over 6%, so a little bit more income. We think being high quality on the international side makes a lot of sense. So, you know, we'll be, Doug, at the uh, NYSE uh, December 20th you know, ringing the opening bell uh, to celebrate, you know, the success of, of Devo and what it's done for investors and, you know, the rating that it's achieved in its peer group. Um, we're really proud of that and uh, happy to have that listed at the NYSE for many years now um, and see, you know, Devo, you know, hit a hit, you know, new all-time highs in terms of performance as well as uh, assets under management. And, you know, those things mean a lot to us because we know it's making a bigger difference for investors in the marketplace. Yeah. And of course, you can watch live on CNBC or follow the live stream at nyc.com forward slash bell. Uh, Christian, how should investors, any advisors that are out there, how should they be engaging with the team at Amplify? Yeah. So the best way to engage with us, I think, is to potentially start on our website, amplifyetfs.com. Pretty straightforward there. We've got a lot of research, um, white papers, infographics on any of our funds. All of our funds have their you know kind of own homepage where you can find 
a lot of the you know monthly or quarterly updates on what's going on with the portfolios. You can look at the investment case and try to you know evaluate whether or not this portfolio or strategy makes sense for you. Um, you know, if you're a financial advisor, we have a distribution team that has geographic regions around the U.S. that um, are, would be happy to speak with you. Uh, if you're an individual investor, you can call our 800 number and ask some questions of those people as well. These ETF specialists we have are highly skilled and communicate regularly with um, investors and advisors about our portfolios. You can also find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Twitter, all the socials, uh, Amplify ETFs is really kind of what you need to search for. And, you know, we continue to produce content in support of uh, the different ETFs we have in, in the marketplace. And, you know, we've got some outstanding partners that we work with, uh, whether that's index providers or actual portfolio managers that are third party that, you know, run some of our funds uh, from a security selection standpoint. And, um, they're out in the marketplace too. So, you know, people like a Kevin Simpson, uh, running our, our Devo ETF or a Tim Seymour from fast money and CNBC running our cannabis ETF. Um, they're kind of doing things, you know, each and every day, kind of in a multiple channels, talking about some of the funds they're involved with here at Amplify. So yeah, reach out. We'd love to speak with you. And we really believe that we could be additive to almost any investor's portfolio kind of due to the breadth of our product line and, and, and our philosophy to be additive uh, to the ETF marketplace. Now that's a wrap on this edition of the Inside ETFs podcast. As a reminder, you can find this episode as well as additional ETF thought leadership and content from Amplify on the New York Stock Exchange's website, etfcentral.com. I want to thank you again, Christian, for being here to share your insights. Please stay tuned for upcoming episodes featuring thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm Douglas Jonas, head of exchange traded products at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Schwab Asset Management is proud to support the Inside ETFs podcast. As one of the nation's largest ETF providers, Schwab Asset Management offers insights and perspectives that can help advisors build on their ETF expertise. Did you know that more millennials are choosing ETFs as their investment vehicle of choice, or that many investors plan to increase their allocation to fixed income, smart beta, and actively managed ETFs? Find out how ETFs can support your clients' goals with Schwab Asset Management's educational resources. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash ETF know-how.